Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey, and today I am so pleased to welcome Matt Stambaugh to the podcast. Uh, and Matt is the Director of Information and Geospatial Technology with a company called GeoVera. And uh, I'm super interested in this area because the uh, developments going on in camera imagery, satellite uh, technology, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, the ability to interpret that data, uh, the use of drone technology to do things like uh, collect information about the world around us is expanding so rapidly. And uh, Matt and team are at the front of all of that. And so it's very handy to comment out what's going on. So Matt, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Thank you for the opportunity, Jeffrey, and the pleasure is all mine. Happy to chat today. <laughs> well, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, we'll see whether you agree when, when we reach the end of the podcast. <laughs> like, fair, that fair was enough. a mistake. I'll reserve, yeah, totally. I'll <laughs> reserve, reserve judgment. For the end. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I start every interview off the same, which is to uh, just have my guest provide a bit of their personal background so that uh, the audience out there can uh, l- learn a little bit about you personally. So uh, let's start there. What's, what's your background? Sure. Well, I won't get too personal. Maybe I'll do a bit more of the professional <laughs> Professional background, background sure. It, it, it's really more, a, I kind of have a mix of IT and geospatial background. The early part of my career was very much focused on enterprise IT deployments for organizations across the country. And then uh, a passion for aviation combined with technology drug me into what I consider kind of the, the first generation of commercial um, unmanned aerial vehicle or UAV use in the yeah. country. And so I was involved in a, a couple of um, Western Canadian UAV startups, had a lot of fun doing that. But my experience in, um, in that space and with my combination of my IT background, my, my interest drove more from the capture of the data into what to do with the data afterwards. I saw a big opportunity yeah. in, in what we can do with all of this 3D um, spatial data. And so I, I went back to school and got a master's of GIS from the University of Calgary, which was a program focused on um, remote sensing, on spatial data analytics, and traditional kind of GIS applications. And, and with that, um, move my focus more into what to do with the data after you capture it. Yeah. And, and that master's combined with my background led me to join, um, at the time, WSP, and then recently, um, our, we've, we've taken the, the geomatics wing of WSP, merged it with the geomatics wing of Altus Group to create GeoVera, which I believe is Canada's largest pure play geomatics firm. But I'm sure there's a fact checker <laughs> out there somewhere that I may have to talk to. So someone is, say it. Yeah, someone's going to challenge you on that front. Uh, curiosity, are you a pilot by chance? I am. I have my private pilot's license. All I mean, right. it, is, it is a little dusty, to be perfectly honest, but yeah. uh, I certainly have a private pilot's license, and that's what helped um, drive that passion into the UAV space. I was thinking, yeah, like if you, it's not until you get up in the air uh, that it, and you look down, you realize uh, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, sh- the shortcomings of a terrestrial view. You know, you can't, you can't see over the horizon. You can't see on the other side of that tree. You can't see on the far side of things. <clears throat> but you get up in the air and suddenly it's all, all laid out for you. But the, um, the, the ability to make sense of it all. Um, is uh, is the question so uh, from dro- from pilot to geotechnology to drones to geo geovera so that's the storyline uh, there you go you mentioned geomatics can you just oh, what does that mean exactly because uh, that's a term that uh, people will hear and uh, it's useful to kind of put it into a context thank you I'm glad you said that because um, my marketing director always tells me to define geomatics, which to be perfectly <laughs> honest, I could use some help on. I think geomatics is a very Canadian term. Oh. Um, it was, I think it's a, it's a Canadian focused term. Mm. It, it is, I, I consider it to be a, a broader expansion on, on survey. You know, I think in a lot of places this would be considered a wing of, of survey, but geomatics in, in my mind is a little bit more broad and it's really the use of any three-dimensional spatial data in an application. And so you think about it, you know, you can get a point somewhere on the earth 
and then there's a lot of fun stuff you can do with that point. Or you can get millions of points to create a more immersive um, data sets. And so geomatics mm -hmm. is really about capturing and measuring um, points, I'll say on the surface of the Earth, but as we know, we've now sent probes to Mars, there's been probes to other planets, and so, you know, there's, there's kind of um, astro-geomatics as well, but let's focus this conversation perhaps on, on Earth. But in my mind, that's it. It's the, the measurement and manipulation of spatial data on the Earth. And is that spatial data natural things like trees, mountains, rivers, streams, or does it also include man-made stuff like cities, or, uh, roads, highway systems? Uh, and is it, is it limited to what you can visibly see, or does it also encompass what you can't see? Because a huge amount of you know, geologic activity in, in oil and gas takes place below surface where it's not visible. Absolutely. So I, I, in my mind, again, happy to be challenged by smarter folks than I, I consider the geomatics part about the capturing of the data and the measurement of the spatial data, that the, the spatial attribute is the critical part of the geomatics set. And then you move into broader, more remote sensing. Say. Mm. And so once you have that spatial data, um, we move into broader applications of remote sensing where you capture other attributes. Mm. So uh, the three-dimensional where this thing or this point is, is the geomatics point. And then you get into, okay, what is it? And so remote sensing is fascinating because you can capture different wavelengths. We can get near-infrared information to start looking into plant oh, health. We can yeah. get, you, know, you can use seismic um, information to, to get you know, different attributes on top of not only where is it, but what is it. And so in my mind, that's when you start expanding beyond geomatics into you know, a broader remote sensing set. But I know in conversations, geomatics can encompass all of that, not just the capture of where it is, but what it is as well. What it is, yeah. I mean, the, the, the merit of this is uh, in, in agricultural applications, you can detect things like, I'm sure of this, as the wave of locust infestations that have been sweeping across Africa. You'll be able to, because of the, the scale of them, you'll be able to see them from, from, from uh, uh, aerial surveys to tell you where on earth the, the insects are at and what they're up to. Absolutely. In fact, that was one of the, the really the most important initial applications and continues to be of, of UAVs is in agriculture and yeah. using multispectral imagery, especially near infrared, because plants will start to show their stress in the near infrared wavelengths before they do it in the visible. So if you're, you know, if you're um, a producer, you want to be able to capture that data, you know, beyond what the human eye Mark One can see, because you get early warning systems on something that's happening. So you might not see the actual bugs, but you'll see the plant's response to that bugs. And then if you want, you know, we could be a different podcast. We can get to the totally esoteric sensors <laughs> that start looking for the chemical pheromones that plants are releasing when these things happen. And so, you know, another conversation that, that, that happens often here is the difference between the sensor and the platform and yeah. then the data that comes out of it. You know, a UAV is just a platform. Uh, uh, you know, an ATV is just a platform. So you, you have to find what's the problem, what's the application, and then match the appropriate sensor on the platform for the data you need to get the information to solve the problem. The decisions you, know, that's you the take, That's the kind of workflows yeah. we work with clients on, is what are you trying to solve, and then we'll find the right way to get it. It's not a one-size-fits-all. So, with, uh, since they, the, uh, I'm, I'm mostly interested, uh, well, I shouldn't say exclusively, but mostly interested in oil and gas, what are the sorts of uses for this in oil and gas? And... Uh, I mean, I can imagine. Um, I, I think one of the things the industry is very interested in is where is my methane coming from these days? I, I can't, you know, I, I can't see it, but I think the sensors might be able to pick it up. Is that an application? Absolutely. I was going to say, I mean, there are so many applications in oil and gas, but methane mm -hmm. is one of the most topical right now. And in fact, mm -hmm. we have a specific solution for that. We have an exact platform. And it's um, at this point, the focus is primarily on the truck based platform. But these sensors can go on UAVs as well mm -hmm. to uh, sense methane and, and methane leaks and to help with uh, many of the, the monitoring programs that are now in place across the country. And so, you know, again, uh, a critical application that we can find the right information flowing all the way back to here's the sensor and here's the platform we need to use to capture that data. And so, so methane sensing is a, a big application of, uh, I would say, geomatics and even, you know, geospatial data capture for oil and gas. Yeah, because it's, the, I mean, the piece that you're capturing here is not just what is the, pr the problem, methane emission, but precisely where is it coming from so that you can then mount an, a, an effective response terrestrially. Where and how much, you know, is it a how problem? How much, yeah. Because, yeah, exactly. you know, because there needs to be thresholds and so it's where and, and is it at a point where it's really a problem? And then to help do some um, interpolation and some mapping to figure out, you know, where mm. is, where do we find it and to localize 
localize where it is. And so absolutely uh, a very interesting application. So the, the um, media frequently has stories that say the, you know, the, the Canada, one example, U.S. chronically, quote, underestimating the sheer amount of methane emissions uh, that are out there uh, coming from oil and gas infrastructure. Why, why is that? Like, it sounds to me that um, the, uh, uh, the sensor technology is either inadequate to the problem or we do not have enough con continuous uh, surveillance of the infrastructure or the interpretation engines which are looking at the data are miscalibrated so the algorithms aren't right. Like, wh where, is the, where, where is this sort of no noise coming from and what's behind it? Any idea? You know, to be to be honest, <clears throat> I, I think I'd have to dig a little deeper into you know the, the specific statements yeah. because we have the technology to, to to sense this, and so I think you know if if you're uh, you know if you're an organization and you have a methane sensing program in place, at that point, if if you have a program in place, I think it would be. Um, very legitimate for you to push back a little on some of those statements. Say, yeah. here's our program. The technology can find it. Um, here's how we're tracking it. And it would come down at that point to your repeat cycles, how often you're you're doing you know, a, a sweep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but you've got the data. And this is what a lot of these regulations are, are pushing for now is um, periodic sweeps. And so you can have defined data points to say, here it is. Like, here's, and, and the big part, and I know this is where um, we, have, we work with a lot of clients, is on once you find something, you've got a certain amount of, of time to, to fix it. And, and that's usually where you know, we make sure we work with our clients to make sure that uh, we, we've, we've you know, provided as effective a program as possible so that when we find something, the information is tra transmitted in a timely fashion yep. so you can then remediate any issues um, within the, the, the required time frame. Now, the, the data collection machinery, the drones, um, the aerial ones I'm thinking about specifically, um, the, the, there are rules in many countries, Canada included, that specify that these, you know, this uh, gear cannot fly over inhabited areas for fear that the equipment will fail, fall from the sky, and, uh, and, and cause um, some catastrophic uh, damage uh, on impact. Um, uh, how do those rules drive the ability of the geomatics industry to uh, do the data collection and surveillance uh, that it needs to do? And here I'm thinking about, uh, and we, uh, there's a lot of infrastructure, oil and gas infrastructure, actually in cities. <laughs> it's just under city, under city streets. And it's in my house. I mean, I've got gas in my house. I have no idea if it's leaking. Uh, so um, I can smell it, but uh, aside from that. But, um, you know, what about the rest of the out, out in that infrastructure? How do the rules drive the effectiveness of UAV platforms to do this sort of uh, work? Well, this is a, it's a great question, and it depends on the country. So I'll focus on Canada, yeah. and, and we do have regulations in place that require it, – it's a risk-based evaluation. And so if you are in what's deemed a riskier flight area, a mm. city would be a great example, or really anywhere that there's – Near an airport. Up, or near an airport, airport exactly. Yeah, one. There is more rigor required to do that flight. And so that's where you know we, we, have, um, we, we have an operation that allows us to fly in those complicated areas. You need to have pilots trained to a higher standard with yep. uh, more hours, with stricter training requirements, hardware that, that meets a higher standard, you know, more safeguards and more fail safes. Yep. And so that's how it's that risk-based evaluation that Transport Canada drives. And, and we work with that. And, and so we are able to fly in more challenging and complicated areas that perhaps some other operators wouldn't have been able to if they mm -hmm. don't have the same, um, you know, operational procedures in place behind the scenes. But it's also why we don't limit ourselves to just UAVs. Because in some cases, a UAV is not the right tool for the job. And so we've got a truck that we can drive around and we can interpolate. We can take senses, we can take readings at um, you know truck level yep. and then uh, run our, our magic sauce in the back end to triangulate that way. And so that's where it's nice to, to be a, a larger geomatics firm is we have the different tools and we have the skill sets to capture that data in a variety of different manners. And then the important part is we're not just a data capture company. We have um, really top-notch analysis as well. And so our staff on the GIS side can then take that data and do something with it. And it's not just the interpolation. It's the visualization as well. And, you know, our, our um, GIS... Uh, managers always says we eat with our eyes and and i i believe it you know that the power of, of a visual is mm. is so much more meaningful than a report like you get a spreadsheet and it takes a lot of cognitive loading to figure out what does that spreadsheet really mean like what yeah. am i seeing what decisions do i need to make if you see a color-coded map with a plume okay right there i can see where the problem yeah. spots are yep. i can see if it's an issue and i can make a decision um a, a, you know much more rapidly much more meaningfully than just text-based data. And so that's where I do feel 
you know, I'm, I'm trying to push wherever possible a more graphical deliverable in almost everything that we do because I find it's more effective to make decisions. On. Yeah, and, and certainly the heavy asset industry, extractive industry, is, is already a very geographically um, intense industry because the physical location of facilities, how adjacent you are to built-up areas, the road systems and power and, and the like all drive the uh, decisions and choices of the industry. I'm going to go back to the, the uh, aerial platform uh, just for a second. So you mentioned, uh, I guess I asked you at the start, you know, are you a pilot? <laughs> There's a reason for that. Someone has to fly the the um, uh, the uh, or to operate, I should say, the uh, aerial vehicle. Um, in Canada, I think some of the rules are pretty strict. Got to be line of sight only, but sometimes you can be beyond horizon or beyond line of sight. Uh, and I know I, I remember I read a media story that said um, the uh, getting beyond line of sight is a major. Um, that's a major milestone when you can get a uh, a uh, unmanned uh, vehicle. Uh, Flying where the the operator is um, not able to maintain per, you know, like eyeball visual contact with that this, with that um, that uh, piece of equipment. Uh, where's the industry at today in terms of um, it being able to uh, fly beyond line of sight? And, and, and what is the implication uh, for the ability to do things like surveil the uh, the landscape? So there are companies that are um, licensed and able to fly beyond line of sight, but I wouldn't mm. say it's fully commercially there yet, right? Okay. And like, so, so for example, we could do a beyond line of sight flight, but it would be, the, the way it would be set up would be more like a pilot or a trial, you know, program. Uh, yeah. um, and, and, and this is where I'd love to, you know, there's some other companies in, in Canada who are, are pushing hard for beyond line of sight because it is a major milestone from a commercial perspective. Um, we, we operate more within the, the kind of today regulations, which is line of sight. Like I would say line of sight is, is the much more is meaningful, normal. Um, mm. is normal. We've been waiting for beyond line of sight for years now and excited yeah. about it. And it yep. will unlock a whole new stream of value for how we can we can price jobs and how we can collect data but that's also why right now we make sure we have meaningful partnerships with um you know basically manned aerial platforms like if if the job is of, of a size or a complexity okay we'll contract one of our partners who can get a you know a manned aircraft up in the air or a helicopter mm -hmm. we'll grab the data that way and it's it's again it's why you know it's important to not be so locked into a certain tool. Say UAVs are the solution to everything. We look at the problem and sometimes, nope, not right now. And my goodness, when beyond line of sight is more of a regular thing and we figured out how to safely integrate UAVs into manned airspace and, and have the safeguards to be confident when it's beyond line of sight and there's some kind of, a, of an issue, it can come down safely or the, the issue can be managed, there will be a whole new generation of use cases that we will be able to, to leverage and approach and unlock more value for our clients. And I'm thinking about basically larger sites, you know, collecting multiple sites in a day, because right now we got to send a crew with with the um, with the unit. Yeah, it's another advantage that that I feel we have over potentially some pure play UAV operators is that we send a survey crew out, and so we can try to layer up different. Um, different jobs at the same time. You know, we can go yeah, that's a, work at once and, and be more efficient with, yeah, with our work. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. The uh, it's, it, it's not in order for this to actually work fully. The uh, having individuals who understand geodata and geospatial data, quote surveyors, unquote, uh, coupled with uh, digital. Um, uh, digital uh, sensor technology, um, aut autonomous technologies, drones and flights. That's a, a composite team and multidisciplinary team that's that's required to be able to successfully tackle this. Exactly, and, and I yeah. think you know what, one one area that I do see us doing more for clients as, as mm -hmm. they approach us is mm -hmm. in that concept of a digital twin. And so this is you know digitize your assets, especially for for you know. Um, anyone who's an asset owner. And, and we can go in there and we can bring multiple tools. So we can have a, a laser scanner that captures high quality 360 pano imagery as well. And we can do a bunch of ground-based data capture at a very high fidelity. And then we can send the UAV up as well and capture that aerial data uh, you know, at a very high quality. Yeah. And we can merge all these data sets together to create a meaningful digital twin, as well as interior scans. You know, That's where UAV is going to have some challenges still. We can get inside. Well, um, yeah, I mean, the, the aerial one, yes, but um, a terrestrial robot crawling around through a, um, 
a uh, facility to, 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 to take LIDAR from inside to build up that composite view of what's actually inside. A facility is actually commonly done in the building side. Um, so as you point out, the, the, the answer here is how do you combine these different data sets uh, that are collected using different platforms and different sensor technologies to create a single composite view could create some value that way. Exactly. And one yeah. area that we've definitely built up expertise in, and it's, it's, it requires expertise, is in merging different data sets. And especially, you know, there, there's a spectrum. And this is one thing that I, I like to work with our clients on, is that you've got a problem and you're trying to solve it, and we want to come with the most cost-effective approach. Because if you're trying to get data for engineering-grade purposes, you mm -hmm. want extremely high precision and accuracy so you can do engineering based on it, fine. Like, we can do that. We can figure out a, a mechanism to do that. And you want to really make sure there's quality control in place when you're merging multiple data sets to get to uh, an appropriate set. But then also, sometimes, you're just looking for um, what I'll term construction progress monitoring or some kind of a progress monitoring application. Yep. You're building an asset or you're, you're building something or you're just monitoring something and you don't need that engineering grade data, which comes at a cost. You just need some visuals. And so we can dial it back a little and have a much more simplistic data capture plan, focus more on imagery, you know, 360 imagery um, that still provides an incredibly valuable visual for any project reviews, any progress reviews. And, and we found over the last year, of course, with COVID and the travel restrictions, it to be a very powerful option because it's incredibly cost effective. And again, we're visual creatures. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to work through a PowerPoint or Gantt chart and say, we've completed 50% of this part of our site, what does that mean? How do you get a visual in, in people's mind? Mm. You know, we go out now at, at, at a much more, you know, at a higher value proposition, lower cost, essentially, provide this this imagery that's incredibly valuable and we've had very positive feedback from our clients who who are working with our progress monitoring portals because we go out there we capture it we do qc on it we make sure it's it's good data and then we upload it to a web portal and just log on and the whole project team can remotely wherever they're at see the site and that's yeah. such a different experience when you're doing <clears throat> excuse me a, a project review to see it and talk about something while everyone's looking at it than trying to, again, explain it via a Gantt chart or a spreadsheet. Or wave your arms around. <laughs> yeah, right? So, I mean, even with the video on, I can, I can be as, as expressive as I yeah. want. It's not the same as pulling up a 3D or at least a 3D image of the site and yeah. saying, here's where we're at. Here's our challenges. This is why this is a problem and why we need to solve this yeah. and get more meaningful discussion on, on the site. Yeah. yeah my, my, in my personal life, uh, there's a uh, real estate development that's about to take place nearby. And um, uh, you, when we try and articulate, well, you know, what will the environment look like after the development is done? It's, it's near impossible without actually having some photographs or some imagery or, or models where you can kind of say, okay, the building will look like this and the road will go here. And it's so much easier and faster when you actually can see some visuals. So that totally, that completely resonates. What about the, uh, now there's a, um, an, an, a whole new world of, of satellite imagery that's coming. That's very high fidelity, oh, very yes. low cost and huge volumes of data uh, coming out of this where's how is this interacting with uh, the you know if you, if you were to combine uh, three yeah, effectively three layers a truck on the ground that's able to kind of look linearly a UAV which is you know maybe maybe a few hundred feet in the air and then a satellite image that's uh, you know being taken from 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 a, uh, quite a distance how do you layer these three together to give you something useful in um, uh, uh, in, a, in a say a methane application I'm very excited about the the evolution of satellite-based applications, yeah. but with with some caveats. You know, satellite imagery is amazing. Murphy's law kicks in. Like, no matter how good the repeat cycle or the temporal resolution is, there will be a cloud over your site with, <laughs> when you want the image, right? So it's yeah. so you got to look at what you know. And so there's different and remote sensing comes into play, different wavelengths depending on what you're you're looking for. Um, but I, I can see that that layered approach is going to be very powerful. You know, satellite is going to provide that coarser both spatial and, and likely temporal resolution coverage to give you a sense of, I should probably look at this. And mm -hmm. if you get a, a ping that this is, there's something going on, then you send in either the truck or the UAV to get um, you know, higher quality data to really understand what's happening. We've got companies like Planet Labs sending up constellations of these little CubeSats. Yeah, and exactly. have evolved. And it, I, I mean, they're amazing what kind of imagery and, and the kind of um, data you can capture now from these little... CubeSats. And, and because they're sending so much up there, the, the temporal resolution has gotten to the point where you can use it for applications you couldn't before. Still early days. 
and and you know so we're gonna have to see how it plays out from a commercial perspective but for, for us it's it's all about the, the portal you know when we talk to clients it's how are you interacting with this data because we've got again the the gis expertise to fuse and merge all these different data sets if it comes from a satellite a truck a uav data is data you know and so we can take the different levels of data to um, generate the information product you're looking for. And I'm trying to avoid too many buzzwords, but like it's that end visual product. What are you trying to solve? And if it's searching for methane, okay, let us have a layered approach to do um, first level scanning at the satellite level, recognizing that you're not always going to be able to, to get that data. Cloud cover, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, you know, yeah. yeah, different different issues. So then we're going to supplement it with a um, periodic either UAV or ground-based approach to make sure you're getting your coverage. Mm-hmm. And, and if there is... Um, you know, something crosses the threshold or we get a point of interest, then you can send ground crews out. And at the end of the day, there's, there's, it's still hard to supplement getting some boots on the ground to take a look. But what we can do is let you know where to look. We can focus your efforts yeah. much more meaningfully. And I found, you know, say vegetation encroachment for, for you know, pipelines and different right-of-ways is another area where this has been helpful. Let us use our remote sensing and, and geospatial expertise to tell you where to go look. So you're not just spending time out in areas that there's no problem. We can help you focus your search and you can get out there and, and in the, the trouble spots and um, take a real look at the problem and, and solve it. So yeah. it's just driving more efficiencies in those processes. Yeah. Now, and then there's a real challenge with boots on the ground, as you say. It's The boots are very expensive now. And it's also um, uh, a safety is a, 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 a not, not just pandemic safety, but simply driving around in uh, the rural uh, uh, hinterland of Alberta, Midland, Texas, uh, looking for uh, infrastructure. It's so much uh, more impactful when you can send the crew precisely to where they need to go, not uh, r- some sort of random loop that they're driving uh, day in and day out. It's much more, much more cost effective. Um, let's turn to the uh, you know the, when when um, uh, if you have any any uh, evidence to share any any stories you can relay about organizations who have gone from zero I don't do this at all to I'm now using this and I've built it into my infrastructure and what's the impact that they report uh, is it is it cost based is it higher productivity is it better quality what what is what drives companies to want to move into uh, aerial geo geotechnology and geospatial data. What what's really warmed my geeky heart is that I, I've started to see companies with more meaningful digital roadmaps, and not just corporate IT digital roadmaps, but operational digital roadmaps. And so, mm-hmm. it takes time, but the, the companies that I've I've seen move along this path, it's it's multiple benefits. The important thing is though, cost is part of it, but I find cost isn't always the only factor, or in fact sometimes the driving factor. It's the flexibility that comes with moving to a more digital um, model. And that is using resources across the globe, across the country, even across the province, to work on a problem without having to be sitting in the same office. And I think, again, COVID is going to drive more of this because yeah. you can unlock um, you can unlock a lot of value within your own organization if you decouple the need to be sitting beside somebody and working on paper um, to, to get the job done. And so this digital roadmap is about having data captured digitally and not just kind of a scan PDF, like actual in a native digital format. It's captured. It's then put into a data mart and a, and a geo kind of data portal. And then at that point, you can do your asset management. You can do future engineering. You mm-hmm. can do um, tracking all digitally. And that means that, that again, people can go in and, and explore your asset, can can visualize it. You can have um, condition assessments tracked and, and reports generated to know when to send crews out. And so the costs come from the overall efficiencies and the savings you see over time from managing this digitally um, instead of, you know, having a bunch of paper or scanned PDFs that, you know, from my corporate IT background, it's challenging to manage, especially when you get to a certain scale. Um, it can be very inefficient to, to, to manage an operation in that sense. And so there is a transition period required. Yeah. But once you get to that digital workflow, um, it unlocks a ton of value across the organization. And, and again, I think We'll see how things move into 2022 and beyond in what the new workplace looks like. But if you're going to attract talent globally, um, having this digital platform is going to allow you to do that. Because not to say you're going to have people working remote 100% of the time, but the, the need to not have someone fly physically to a site every time they need to make a decision is going to help. I mean, if I you go on a flight, you know, you're tired. If you're bouncing all over the place, it's tough to stay focused. Sometimes you got to go on site. I'm not going to discount that. 
but having that flexibility, that, ab that, that ability to have a global team um, or, or just you know, a, a team working remotely and collaborating on a high value project, a lot of money at stake, it's very valuable. And so watching these digital roadmaps evolve and supporting clients in that journey has been um, both very exciting and meaningful and also very beneficial to see the value being unlocked. You know, but I, I can't, you know, what's the return on investment? Oh man, there's so many variables. You got to look at every individual um, experience, but I, I truly believe and I've seen it. It's unlocked once you get there. And it's like everything else that's a digital roadmap and, and in corporate IT and in geospatial, I've seen it. You got to have a clear plan because if you get started and don't have a clear vision of where you want to get to, you can get stuck in the middle. You can get stuck in the mud, stuck halfway, and then you're dealing with the worst of both worlds. Yeah. And so having that nice program um, and getting to a clear endpoint, that's where you unlock your value. Yeah. And also, it'll uh, spend a lot of money and uh, have have not enough to show for it at the end, which is another common problem. Let me sort of wrap up with uh, kind of another question in the back of my mind, which is uh, uh, relates to the data and the data interpretation. Uh, these the, one of the issues with these platforms is that they generate almost too much data. And, uh, and and so now we're really turning to the utility of these machine tools, um, machine learning algorithms, uh, things that can actually interpret the data. And uh, you, it, 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 you can imagine, you know, I, you have a, a satellite uh, or a drone that's taken thousands and thousands of images in a single flight. How do you find the 12 images that you really need to pay attention to without having a human sit down and have to look through them all? Um, and uh, so where where is that technology dimension at these days? This is sort of the interpretation of the data, not just the collection of it, but the, the interpretation of it. I would say it's very mature in the two-dimensional space, and it's getting there for the three-dimensional. What, I, what mm. I mean is that if you've got um, a bunch of two-dimensional imagery and you need to find a something, right? I need yeah. to identify a wellhead, then there's yeah. very mature applications of that. But there's training involved, and that's why it's really important to understand what are you trying to solve? What's the question you're trying to answer? Because yeah. then, um, you know, groups like ourselves can help you solve that. But there might be training involved on the, on the sets. You know, we need to have a plan to help you answer that question because otherwise you're absolutely right. The amount, the raw amount of data that's captured now is mind-boggling. Just managing that data um, is a big part of our challenge. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's big a job. part where we're helping our clients work with because you know we're a spatial data management firm, um, and it gets to be out of control if if you just capture data and don't have a plan as to what to do with it. And, and so you know you need to have a plan on what to do with all this data, and then what do you need and what can you get rid of? Because just storing all this historical data, it, the, it, it adds up. For sure. And so for 2D, you know, you can find great algorithms, computer vision that, that'll identify different assets. If you're trying to find something, that's pretty mature. Um, 3D, it's, it's getting much more uh, meaningful. But 3D, because 3D data is, is just massive, you know, terabytes and terabytes for even, um, you know, reasonably limited site. And so you want to be able to capture that data and then understand what are you doing with it? What can we extract? In many cases, we go from, say, a, a large, large point cloud to a 3D model which is much smaller and easier to manage. And the model allows us to put attributes onto it. So the, the 3D model starts to look like your classic 2D GIS into a 3D world with um, you know, attributes and the ability to run queries and searches. But sometimes you want that point cloud. And so it all comes down to the application. Yeah. And what is the can, problem you know, you're trying you, to solve? What's the problem you're trying to solve? And yeah. then there's a tool for the job. But one area, I mean, it is important to recognize that there is just uh, an incredible pace of innovation in computer vision, a lot of it is being driven by the the strong desire for self-driving cars. I find, you know, mm -hmm. so you got companies like Google investing ridiculous amounts of money to solve problems for self-driving cars, and then they're giving it away. You know, I got to give gotta give credit. There's a lot of open source um, libraries and solutions that that are being. Um, presented so we can take some of those learnings that the companies are doing for other applications yeah. and convert it into an oil and gas application. And so, you know, if if you got a problem, you know, and and the solution isn't quite there right now, you're not going to have to wait long wait, in, wait. in my yeah. mind until wait wait 6 months and it's probably going to be Check back you know, in. A, a click and go, right? <laughs> so it's it's been fascinating to watch the pace of innovation in this space. Yeah. Really well, exciting. watch watch this space. And uh, so uh, with that uh, Matt, uh, uh, thank you very much for coming on uh, Digital and Gas today and and uh, walking us through the uh, developments in the world of geomatics, geospatial data, uh, the uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, data collection, back-end data interpretation, use cases in oil and gas, all been very fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on.
Thank you, Jeffrey. And and at at the end here, I stick with my initial. It was a true pleasure. (laughs) It was a pleasure to be on the show, and and thank you for the time and opportunity once again. If people want to learn more about uh, this particular topic area, they can always visit Wikipedia, uh, but they might be better off if they track down Geovera. Where would they find you? And so you can go online, mm. www.geovera2rs.com, and um, please track me down. I would love to, to have a chat with anybody who's interested in talking more about this. My contact information should be on the website. Brilliant. And happy to have a follow-up chat. Very good. This has been another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. If you like what you've heard, please press the like button or leave a comment, and Matt or myself will get back to you. And uh, otherwise, uh, share this with your network so that others can learn more about this uh, fascinating and developing world. And I will return in short order with another episode. Bye for now.